Hello, Hi. Karen. Hey. Uh, so Karen Nussbaum is the founding director of Working America and the Working America Education Fund. She was a founder and director of 9 to 5, the National Association of Working Women. She was president of SEIU District 925. And she's also the former director of the U.S. Labor Department's Women's Bureau and co-author of the books Solutions for the New Workforce and 9 to 5. Karen, again, welcome to The Jacobin Show. Hey, I'm really happy to be here. I love Jacobin. And I have to tell you, my dad, who is 97, is a working actor. And he's really unhappy because mm. he hasn't been able to get a gig since the pandemic. But uh, that's yeah. amazing. <laughs> yeah, thanks um, so well, much. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Um, I was just going to say, on the subject of acting, um, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to sort of start off by saying that I think lots of people are familiar with the comedy uh, Nine to Five, which, you know, of course, stars Jane Fonda, Dolly Parton, and Lily Tomlin. And I think, I think a lot of people, you know, think of the Dolly Parton song Nine to Five as kind of this great working class anthem, and they love the movie because it's this this like madcap adventure of women office workers who are rising up against a sexist and incompetent boss. Um, but I think that not everybody knows that the movie was actually inspired by a real group of women clerical workers in the 1970s. Um, this became a national organization, which of course is nine to five. Um, and then later was a union, uh, SEIU local nine to five, which I love. Um, and you, of course, were one of the co-founders of 9 to 5. So just to start off, can you talk a little bit about um, what you and other secretaries and clerical workers were sort of facing on the eve of starting 9 to 5 um, and, and what really pushed you to organize? Well, I was a political activist. I had been very active in the anti-war movement, which is actually where I met Jane Fonda originally. And uh, there was, you know, it was a time of tremendous upheaval. There was a huge uh, political organizing around the, the war. Uh, the women's movement was growing up. There was a huge, uh, the, uh, there was a disaster with a disgraced president, Nixon. We forget about, you know, we, we get so fixated on Trump, we forget what a monster Nixon was. And uh, typically at the, at the same time, and you had this growth of social movements as well. And, uh, um, but as an individual person, I was an activist in the women's movement and the, and the anti-war movement. And I had to work, I had to pay my bills like anybody else. And it, and it didn't take me long to realize that I could also be organizing on the job. There were so few jobs available for women. I got what most women ended up doing, which was to be a clerical worker. Uh, and then we began to, while the, the women's movement really hadn't been speaking to working women for the most part, uh, what we found is if we, we could make it our own, we could create a, a a space in the women's movement for working women. And as we organized, we could transform the labor movement as well. And uh, can you kind of paint a picture for people, you know, before nine to five and the gains that you all made, you know, what was li life like for clerical uh, women workers in terms of the, the treatment they had to put up with, you know, what, what was considered normal back then for women workers? Well, to start with, when you were looking for a job, you'd look at want ads and they had help wanted men and help wanted women. So it was really explicit right out there that there were just some jobs for women and and uh, you don't even bother to get the jobs for men. Uh, as a clerical worker, you a lot of the, my co-workers felt good about the fact that we had to dress up to go to work. So that must mean that we were better than factory workers. But once we started looking at the statistics, we realized that we made much less than factory workers. Uh, sexual harassment was a term that really hadn't even been coined yet, uh, and it was endemic. At nine to five, after we soon after we started, we started running contests, the pettiest office procedure, the bad boss award, uh, those kinds of things. And the, the entries were astonishing. The boss who required his secretary to sew up his pants while he had them on. Another boss who had his secretary, gave his secretary a beeper, sent her out at, at five o'clock at, at the end of the workday to the local bar and then to let him know if there were any women in the bar. 
And we know that these stories were true because these men and their secretaries ended up going on television. Phil Donahue, other television shows would bring them on after we had given them the awards. And they wouldn't even, they weren't even embarrassed. It was just accepted. Uh, so you had low pay, um, uh, no opportunity for advancement, casual sexual harassment. Um, that's what work was like in those days. And just just to follow up on that, um, so so something that you alluded to uh, just now, and something that I remember from the Nine to Five documentary is that um, the women of Nine to Five, the the secretaries and clerical workers didn't really identify with the feminist movement, as you said, and also were not part of the labor movement, at least in the beginning. So they were kind of like at the intersection of the two, but also kind of outside of the two. Um, and and there was something in the documentary that really struck me, which was that um, uh, one woman who was part of the organization uh, said something like, well, like we don't want to demonstrate because that that looks too radical. Um, and that kind of speaks to some of the other actions that you just mentioned. So could you talk a little bit about who the women of nine to five were and, and why they didn't identify with either the feminist movement or the labor movement at the time? Well, the our ambition was always to reach out as broadly as possible. That uh, we always believe that you shouldn't make your words be the enemy of your ideas. And at the time you had a labor movement that uh, had taken a step back, wasn't doing much organizing, uh, was seen as the domain of men. Um, you know, they, they had uh, hit a peak in membership and were mostly administering contracts around then. Uh, there had been a big wave of organizing spurred by the civil rights movement, largely in the public sector and in uh, the healthcare industry. Uh, but outside of that, there, there wasn't much room. And the women's movement uh, was seen as being, uh, you know, it uh, had been named as women's libbers, you know, that it, it had a, 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 an image that didn't seem um, appealing to most working women. So we just took those ideas about women's equality, women's empowerment, the right to have a say on the job, uh, that, that women were legitimate workers no matter how we were treated, and broke that down into small enough bites that any woman could join, any woman could find strength in herself from being part of something bigger. Uh, any woman could grow from that experience and then begin to identify in a much um, bigger way. We had no backlash from women. Um, it, you know, we were able to uh, talk about things in a way that uh, just opened a door, didn't close any doors, uh, and it was wildly successful. And uh, to, to follow up on this, um, you know, talking about how you made the organization as broad and inclusive as possible. And, and this might be kind of a leading question, but I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts on this, that, I mean, I think this is a huge problem on the left today, if I'm being frank, that, you know, instead of the mindset of being as broad and, you know, reaching to people that don't al already agree with us, it's like, let's add litmus tests upon litmus tests upon litmus tests. I mean, do you agree with that? Do you see that as like an issue uh, that's out there now among the left? Yeah, I do think it's a problem. And the work that I do with Working America now, Working America is a, and uh, we call it the community affiliate of the FLCIO. It's the community organization that goes out every night into working class communities. Uh, going door to door when there's a pandemic, um, talking with people, the people who aren't talking to us, you know, that you we have to go out there and not prejudge what people are going to think, who they are, how they're going to respond. Uh, we need to be human beings. And if you do that, then you can have the chance of connecting with someone as another human being. Um, we go into working class neighborhoods. We uh, talk to people who don't have a union on a job because they already have a connection. Uh, and the people who are apolitical or who are uh, Trump voters or swing voters and have the conversations with them about what do you care about? Um, 
uh, there's strength in numbers that if we join together, become a member tonight, and if we join together, then we can do something about the big corporations that have way too much control over our government and our economy. That's a message that, that two thirds of the people we talk to every single night agree with and sign up and become a member. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, if you break it down and you don't have a prejudice about who you're talking to, you can make a connection that can turn into worker power. So something that is, um, I think, kind of related to that is uh, uh, in the documentary Nine to Five, I think I think you or one of your colleagues point out that in the 1970s, um, clerical workers actually were a much larger part of the workforce than manufacturing workers or construction workers. Um, and, you know, uh, this is also, as you mentioned, a time when women are entering the workforce in very large numbers. So in a way, this was a sector that was almost primed to be organized or almost ready to be organized. And I guess I'm wondering if you see any analogous part of the workforce today. Uh, sure. And, you know, in a way, but the, the conflict that we were experiencing was that here, most people thought the common worker was a man in a hard hat. But in fact, there were far more women behind a keyboard than there were men in hard hats. Um, but just our sheer size didn't make us ready to organize because we had we were invisible. Mm -hmm. We didn't exist in popular culture. We didn't exist as a, a recognized workforce. Um, and you have to create a a sense of identity and common uh, cause with people, uh, uh, you know, across race and class who can share the same concerns. With so many women in just a handful of jobs, we were middle class and working class women, white, uh, black, brown, all races. Um, uh, and we we came together consciously. You know, you had to be very thoughtful about building the organization and making it inclusive. And you can see that from this picture um, uh, of, of women in Cleveland. And here are women uh, our, our members in Cincinnati who worked for four years to bring a union to the clerical workers at their campus. These were largely conservative, apolitical women, and you can see how furious they are and how ready to fight. Uh, that's the potential that we have. Um, if we do good organizing, if we're conscious about breaking down divides, um, and if we're serious about power, um, there's a, I guess this might be a spoiler alert, but there's an interesting moment in the movie where, you know, you all got organized, you confronted the boss and then nothing happened. And then you realize, oh, we should maybe learn about organizing. So, and you, people took uh, trainings from the Midwest Academy. Can you tell me like, what did people learn from the Midwest Academy that they didn't have before? You know, the, the Midwest Academy had just started and they were teaching basic community organizing techniques. And what we did was we took, you know, uh, bring people together and have the next thing that you're gonna do uh, ready to go and have a target uh, and, you know, know what you're gonna demand and what you're gonna do when they don't agree to the demands and, you know, basic strategy stuff and basic um, ways to keep people engaged. Uh, what we did is we took community organizing tactics and we brought it into downtown. Uh, we organized in workplaces and our community though was downtown in cities around the country. Um, uh, so we were able to open up a space for organizing, a discussion around jobs, uh, a discussion about rights and respect for women workers, which then created a brand new opportunity to talk about unions. And I think if we hadn't had that space that we created, then it would we wouldn't have been able to move to the next step. And I think that we're seeing that today, Fight for 15, uh, is a great example of engaging the discussion, uh, creating an identity among workers who otherwise had not had a common identity uh, and a strategy to unionize at the same time. 
So before we um, dive into 9 to 5 affiliating with SEIU, um, I, I do want to pause on 9 to 5 the movie, um, which came sort of in between 9 to 5 the organization and 9 to 5 the union. Um, so you had mentioned you knew Jane Fonda from Vietnam War, um, anti-war activism. Can you talk a little bit about how the movie came to fruition and specifically um, why why was it important to make this movie a comedy and not a documentary, which of course comes later, but also not like a serious drama? Yeah, I, I was friends with Jane. We'd been at meetings over the years. And uh, then when the war finally ended in 1975, Jane decided to go back into her career as an actress. Here you see her at our annual summer school that we had at Bryn Mawr College every year uh, with our Raises Not Roses t-shirt. <laughs> Uh, uh, Jane, uh, I would tell her about the organizing that we were doing and what was happening in, in these workplaces and, and the, the bubbling up of, you know, response from women all around the country. And it was her idea to make a movie. She said, I want to make a contribution in the best way I know how, and that's to make a major motion picture. So it was her idea, but then I had to write a, a, a memo a pitch memo to the studio about why there would be an audience uh, because women office workers had been completely invisible in popular culture. There'd been nothing with the exception of Susie the secretary on television in the 1950s. Um, so uh, Jane uh, thinks about making the movie. She puts together the cast and uh, she spent one long night with our, about 40 of our members in Cleveland asking them about their jobs. Uh, and towards the end of the discussion, she says, you know, let me just ask, has anybody ever dreamed about killing their boss? And the organizers in the room were all horrified, you know, <laughs> oh, so outlandish. How can, you know, so Hollywood, how can she ask that? But the room lit up because every single woman <laughs> had a story about her fantasy about killing her boss. And all of that comes into the movie. Jane had, and that's what made the difference for Jane. She originally thought it was going to be a drama, and then she realized it had to be a farce. Uh, so the movie ends up being, you know, more modern times than Norma Ray, uh, And I think that's what makes it so wildly affected. I think it's the best example of popular culture catapulting a social movement, uh, that it comes right on the, you know, it, it builds on a, a growing social movement uh, and then moves the discussion away from the debate about, you know, is there discrimination in the workplace? Because millions of people go into a movie theater and when they come out, of course there's discrimination in the workplace. It's And it's outrageous. And now the discussion becomes, what are we going to do about it? Um, it's a, uh, it, it was a thrilling moment. And we had actually started our union as a local union in Boston in, the, uh, in 1975. But right around the time that the movie came out, we became a national union. And we just embraced, we, we decided to call everything nine to five. Nine to five, the association, you know, it's got the character and concerns of the working move, women's movement, it's got the power of a union, our union nine to five, and it's got the glamour of Hollywood. We thought, I hope everybody gets confused about it because that's the power in it. <laughs> Turns out the U.S. working class is extremely militant. Everyone wants to kill their boss, apparently. Uh, who would have known? Um, yeah, if you only just connect that to like, grievances you know right. yeah not as contract, sexy you know there's a few steps in between right right I do love it that in the movie Nine to Five, the fantasies that the workers have about like kidnapping and offing the boss were actually drawn from things that women workers oh, had yeah. told Jane Fonda. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> well, I don't think it would have been as successful. You know, if, the, if Hollywood writers had made it up, it wouldn't mm -hmm. have landed. Uh, but because it was grew right out of the experience of women, it's like evergreen. I mean. I can't tell you the young people I know who tell me that their grandmothers made them watch nine to five with them. <laughs> and I think or that means the, or the song, you know, which is evergreen yeah. as well. It's kind of amazing. Uh, but the the tragedy is that um, you know this movement that had this fantastic momentum 
um, just crashed on a uh, you know a, a sharp right turn, both in politics and corporate policy in in the states in the eighties. Mm -hmm. uh, we announced the um, uh, the beginning of our national union, District Nine Two Five, the week that uh, President Reagan fired all of the union members from the air traffic controllers. Um, so you you know it's the perfect uh, uh, example of these two trends that were going uh, happening at the same time: this momentum among workers and this uh, um, crackdown on the part of uh, both co a corporate elite that had decided they were no longer going to uh, compete on the high road, they were gonna compete on the low road in the face of global competition. And they take out unions over the next 15 years. Uh, and the birth of uh, the uh, a consolidated new right wing. Uh, the same year that we started nine to five, Phyllis Schlafly started uh, Stop ERA. We didn't come in conflict with it, but that whole movement just gained tremendous steam and we weren't prepared for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to go back a little bit, so I'll combine two questions in one. So, you know, nine to five is first this organization, not quite a union. So first question is what did nine to five win concretely uh, for clerical workers? And then what prompted the decision to become a union? Uh, I'm sorry, what was the second part? Uh, what what prompted the decision to become a union? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, to tell you the truth, um, we knew about unions. <laughs> we, we knew there was power in unions, and it was a strategy. It's a It was an approach that said, let's open the door as wide as we can, bring people in, give them transformative experiences, and then cement that in permanent institutions that can really wield power. Uh, so it was always uh, uh, a, a way to approach building both movement and organization. The, um, uh, we, we, we really made a big difference. What can I tell you? You know, things that if you watch the nine to five documentary now, you, younger people are appalled at what the working conditions were like. Uh, the casual uh, sexual harassment is is illegal and uh, not acceptable. It may go on, but at least it's not acceptable. Uh, but it was completely uh, uh, ordinary in those days. Um, the fact that women got paid less than men because the men were men and supported families, presumably. Well, that was something your boss would tell you, and that wasn't illegal. Uh, we were able to uh, to change women's role in the workplace, and I'll tell you the 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 um, the momentum that we built, both through our public action, through our lawsuits, through our unionization put so much pressure on employers that they, by the 80s, decided, okay, we'll, we'll create a safety valve here. We'll let uh, higher level women, college educated, middle class, mostly white women into the game, let them be professionals and uh, managers, where those jobs have been totally uh, un unavailable to women until the 80s. And so they split the workforce. They met the demands of higher level women and they made life and work worse for working class women. Uh, and, and we've been living with that strategy for the last two generations. Uh, we have to um, celebrate the real changes that we made uh, we have to celebrate the ways unions have changed because there were powerful women coming in with our own agenda and our own power into unions. Um, those are important changes, uh, but we have to make sure that we are better prepared going into this next decade of massive opportunity uh, that we uh, build the powerful permanent organizations that we need. Yeah, so so that reminds me of of something that I wanted to ask you, which which you kind of got at just now. Um, 
when I was watching, you know, the nine to five documentary, I, I was struck that one of the demands of the the secretaries and the women workers was they wanted more opportunities for advancement and promotion. And that absolutely made sense in, in you know, that context where, you know, as you say, there was a huge pay disparity. Women were being passed over for for advancement and promotion. And that's actually a theme in the movie nine to five as well. Um, and Something that you just brought up now, um, which I have been thinking a lot about, is I think that this demand for opportunities for advancement, especially among, as you were saying, like professional class women now, that's almost in many cases supplanted the demand for collective action. And I think the mm -hmm. most famous example is like Sheryl Sandberg lean in or like on an even more abstract level, like when Hillary Clinton was running for president in 2016, you heard a lot of rhetoric like, well, this this will be great for all working women because she's breaking the glass ceiling. Um, and of course, you know, at Jacobin, we always say like, well, well, we're interested in raising the floor for right. the many rather than breaking the ceiling for the few. But I'm wondering as somebody who has kind of, who, who you know, um, has obviously been in a movement that took that demand very seriously when it was when when it was um, a huge issue for women in the workplace. Like, how do we reconcile that tension? I'll tell you, Jen. I never thought that was a very important demand, <laughs> <laughs> but and, and to me, it was always a symbol of how um, how constrained the imagination of so many women was at the time. You know, we. The, we we did early in the uh, beginning of nine to five the association we created the nine to five bill of rights and you know and, and so we got you know fifty or hundred members together and they debated what to go into the bill of rights and it includes things like job posting but it doesn't include you know child care or mm -hmm. you know higher pay or you know. And it's that it represented what women at the time felt that they could ask for. Uh, their, their imaginations weren't big enough. Now, it was also, as you say, a, a huge problem at the time. Um, but how do you make solutions be um, about the collective good, not about allowing individuals to then find their way and then, and then you're left with nothing? Uh, could you go a little bit into like the organizing mechanics of how you made the organization racially diverse and reach truly, like, you know, all the all the workers that there were to be reached? Yeah, you know, it's it's not that complicated. It's just hard. <laughs> you know, you have to be really thoughtful about it. Mm -hmm. um, so we never had a you know a meeting or a. Uh, an event or people who spoke to the press. There was nothing that we ever did that didn't always have, it, it was always racially integrated. It always had older women and younger women. It always had working class women and middle class women. And it was just, it was what we taught all of our organizers to do. It's how we built our organizing teams. Uh, and that's that was their job going into the into the organizing as well that you have to uh, live what you preach and then you have to give people experiences that help them overcome the limits of their own lives um, so you know you it, when you team uh, co-chairs who are of different races or uh, you know, uh, two people who have to bring the snacks to the next meeting, and they are from different industries and are you know the one's college educated and one has a high school education. You bring people together who otherwise don't have that opportunity, and then they make that connection and they and they make common cause, and it uh, builds. It, you know, you, you just have to think about it. It's just good organizing. And, um, and you, you know, it gets back to what you were talking about earlier, Jen, that you don't have litmus tests, that you don't tell people what they can say and what they can't say, um, that uh, you have to let people be humans and learn from their experience. Now we were, that doesn't mean we didn't have problems, especially on the union side, you know, with, a, with the association, when you're doing organizing um, 
citywide, you've got limitless numbers of people you can try to attract. In an organizing campaign, you've got you know, a limited workforce. And uh, we had to be, you know, we had to insist that white workers um, respect black organizers. Um, and it, it just had to be clear that that's what we were about. So something that I also wanted to ask is as somebody who's been kind of part of the labor movement or part of a union proper, and then of course, um, outside of that, um, I think these days, you had mentioned the Fight for 15 earlier. Um, we have we have other sort of pro-worker organizations that are not unions proper, um, not just the Fight for 15, but we also have things like the National Domestic Workers Alliance or like the New York Taxi Workers Alliance. Um, Sometimes these are organizations that, you know, are made up of people who don't have collective bargaining rights because they're classified as independent contractors, um, you know, or their worker centers or or just just kind of there's a network of um, pro labor or like pro worker organizations that aren't unions proper, as I say. Um, I think people used to call this alt labor. I don't know if people are still using that term, um, but I'm wondering what you see as the potential. Do you see do you see there being a potential for uh, this this kind of network to grow or to be integrated into the labor movement? Um, yes and no. I think it, it depends on what people do and the alliances that they make. Um, one trajectory for uh, what used to be called alt labor organizations is integrating people into the workforce. That doesn't necessarily mean integrating them into the workforce uh, in the context of greater worker power. Uh, there's, a, there's an important job to be done about uh, raising standards. And these uh, organizations do fantastic work in raising standards. Uh, but that's not the same as power. You need power to raise standards, but it doesn't necessarily give you power. It doesn't give you that ongoing power. Uh, and so I would uh, I think that the strategy of having an outward facing non-collective bargaining organization that works with collective bargaining organizations is a good one. And certainly that's what the, the intent is for Fight for 15 and with many of these worker center organizations as well. Um, but, uh, but I think if the left doesn't appreciate the, sp the special unique uh, value of unions um, and do everything that we can to make sure that the trade union movement survives and thrives in this next period, uh, then we will, uh, you know, we'll lose it all. There's no substitute for democratic, self-sustaining organizations of working people. Uh, you know, getting a grant from Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates, you know, awesome if you can do it, but they're not going to fund Amazon workers to organize. They're not going to fund any workers to organize. Uh, we need to pay for our own organizations. We need to vote on what we care about. We need to exercise democracy in our daily lives. Uh, I, I talked to a, a local labor leader who said, we need more organizations where people uh, you know, take minutes, you know, where where there's a, a, a daily life of the organization where you practice democracy. We need that for our democracy in our country, too. Um, so I, I think that there is an extremely important role for uh, organizations that aren't collective bargaining organizations to reach big numbers of workers, uh, but there is no substitute for unions. Very well said. Um, so when you look out today, I mean, what would you say are the biggest challenges facing a uh, woman in the workplace today? <laughs> or is it all yeah. the same? <laughs> well, you know, one of the shocking things about the documentary is that the agenda is not that much different. Um, you know, some things are now taboo, but like, what does that get us? <laughs> You know, our, our, our pay is less, our jobs are more insecure. We don't have, you know, pensions, whoever heard of a pension, <laughs> those things used to exist. Um, and when I started working in 1970, I had, I made minimum wage, but I had five days sick leave and five days vacation. And yeah, that's our very first, um, 
uh, National Secretary's Day uh, protest in 1974, um, uh, work has got, as we all know, is worse now than it was 50 years ago. There's no future for most workers. The gig economy is a horror show. Um, so we've got all the problems that we had then of, you know, lack of power, lack of respect, lack of control, um, and uh, magnified uh, because there's, they're even, because now you aren't even a worker in the gig economy, but you're just, uh, uh, you know, a battered cog. Um, so uh, I think that, um, the the organizing principles are the same as they were in the 50s. Um, the marriage of movements with institutions is the same, uh, but that we have to be crystal clear about just how powerful the opposition is. Uh, they are uh, in disarray, and we better take advantage of that and build institutions while we can. All right, so I think our last question, unfortunately, um, do you want to say anything more about uh, Working America, what the organization is, yeah. what they're working on? Yeah, sure. No, I, you know, I loved nine to five all those years, and I love Working America. <laughs> Working America is this really unique organization. We've got three and a half million members, and they're the people who are not in anybody else's organization, at least on the left. We know that because we actually matched our membership list with that of of. Uh, uh, the, the big uh, catalyst list that capture everybody else's organization. There's like 10% overlap. White working class, black working class, Latino working class, um, that's who our members are. They are largely apolitical. Uh, they're the people who aren't on the hard right or the hard left. They're not watching cable TV. Uh, and for that reason, they are open to discussion. Um, we find that uh, a conversation at the door with a stranger is amazingly powerful. And we marry that with the very um, best analytics out there. Uh, we believe that everything that you do has to count because we're spending very often workers' dues. We're part of the labor movement. And we want to make sure that every penny that we spend that comes from a worker's dues is one that helps build a powerful movement of workers. Um, we uh, were had a, a tremendous effect in the last election on, on moving Trump voters to vote for Biden. Um, um, we've got all different ways to, to demonstrate that. And now we really want to, you know, these next four years are so crucial. Uh, we need to reach those apolitical people who are so vulnerable to the right wing um, and make sure that, uh, you know, that we deprive the right of their recruits to fascism, really, and bring them over to our side. Uh, it can be done. We do it every single day. It's a really um, uh, glorious mission. Uh, and it's one that I invite everybody to join me in. Awesome. Um, I think that's all the time we have, Jen, unless you have any last questions. I think that's a great note to end on. Um, yeah. And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, this was very great talking about uh, 9 to 5, the organization, 9 to 5, the SEIU local, and of course, 9 to 5, the movie. <laughs> well, Jen and Paul, thank you. It was a lot of fun. You yeah. Thank you, Karen. So much. Great. Bye. Bye.